on February 25th earlier this year. Now, although the world has changed in many ways over the past nine months, the Canadian oil and gas sector continues to face a state of great uncertainty. And the families whose livelihoods depend on the sector still face what many say is an unprecedented struggle, major anxiety about their futures and complete financial despair. Entire communities are at risk because of the steady decline of oil and gas activity and historic levels of bankruptcies and investment losses in Canadian oil and gas, and that damage has rippled across the country. Since 2015, more than 200,000 jobs have been lost in the Canadian energy sector. It's devastated families and entire communities. There are many social consequences. A recent study from the University of Calgary School of Public Policy said that for every 1% increase in unemployment, 16 Albertans will die by suicide. Never has a Canadian industry faced such a severe triple threat. Global oversupply and demand drops, a collapse of global prices, and a lack of market access. But even before COVID-19, a combination of economic policy, legislative, and regulatory factors in Canada led to a historic and major collapse in investments, small businesses, and jobs while energy sectors in the United States and across the country were thriving. COVID-19 only exasperated what energy workers in my backyard of Lakeland would characterize as, quote, carnage. A dire situation shared by energy workers across Canada, from BC to Ontario to come by chance in Newfoundland and Labrador. Canadian oil and gas producers are world leaders in environmental remediation and reclamation, but one consequence of this perfect storm of challenges is that the record numbers of business bankruptcies have caused the number of orphan wells to increase by over 300% since 2015. It's an urgent economic and environmental challenge for rural municipal governments, for landowners on Crown land and in Indigenous communities. Mark Doran's family farm in Didsbury, Alberta, is at risk. He says, quote, the value of the land's at stake. It's rendered literally worthless. And Michelle Lavasseur, economic development officer for the town of Kalmar, says it's a financial burden that's, quote, not fiscally responsible to ask our current residents to fund. Normally, orphan wells become the responsibility of the prov provincial orphan well associations and funds. In strong economic conditions, they're remedied on schedule, through levies, on all the other active producers, but these orphan well funds are being overwhelmed, putting taxpayers at risk for eventually having to bear 100% of the costs for decommissioning, closure, remediation and reclamation. Between 2015 and 2018, in Alberta alone, the number of orphan wells skyrocketed from 768 to over 3,400, and today there are a total of 97,000 inactive wells in Alberta. The Alberta Orphan Well Association has an inventory of 2,983 orphan wells for abandonment and 3,284 sites for reclamation. In BC, there are over 300 orphan wells that need to be decommissioned. Half of those wells are on protected farmlands, and there are over 7,000 more in active wells. BC's Auditor General estimates it could cost up to $3 billion to reclaim all the orphan wells and facilities there. By percentage, BC actually has the largest increase of orphan wells since 2015 at 600%. Saskatchewan has more than 600 orphan wells and 30,000 inactive wells. The province's Auditor, Auditor General estimates it would cost $4 billion to decommission all their existing wells. In Ontario, there are almost 900 inactive wells that could become orphaned if more companies go bankrupt mostly throughout the southwestern part of the province. Overall, there are more than 130,000 inactive orphaned and abandoned wells in Canada. It's estimated that it could cost between 30 and $70 billion to fully decommission all current active and inactive oil and gas wells in Canada. That's why it's so crucial for the federal government to lead and to continue to take action on this national environmental and fiscal challenge. There's no doubt that it's complex and it requires a multi-pronged effort from provincial and federal governments and importantly from the private sector. This year, the Alberta government announced an additional $100 million loan to the Provincial Orphan Well Fund to remediate 1,000 wells. In April, the federal government announced $1 billion for Alberta, $400 million for Saskatchewan, and $120 million for BC for abandoned and orphan wells. 
I supported that one-time funding as a first step, but I think the government must adopt a permanent fiscal incentive to enable the private sector to raise funds dedicated solely to reclamation and remediation. Such an initiative recognizes the financial and economic reality that Canadian oil and gas producers face, while it emphasizes the primary role of the private sector to fulfill the environmental duties inherent in their responsible development of oil and gas resources in Canada. So what Bill C-221 proposes is a non-refundable tax credit that could eventually enable a flow-through share provision uh, to encourage small and medium producers to take action on the pressing challenge of suspended and inactive wells and immediately create service jobs in communities and regions that need them most. I hope Canadians will note that my bill applies only to small and medium producers that are struggling the most, which are responsible for about one quarter of total Canadian oil production. These producers have, on average, one well for every 10 wells of large multinational operators, which won't qualify for this tax credit. And in 2017 and 2018, more than two-thirds of those small and medium-sized companies lost money. So it's urgent. The first part of Bill C-221 creates a non-refundable tax credit that will help small and medium oil and gas producers right away. The second part makes the case for this credit to qualify for the flow-through share provisions of the Income Tax Act. That's the government's part to do. So when a producer wants to raise money from private investors, the producer can attach the value of this tax credit to a share of the company that is sold to an investor. The investor buys the share and the tax credit, and in this way, the value of the tax credit flows through to the shareholder. What this means is that the tax credit the producer gives up becomes the profit margin for the investor that purchases these shares. That's a big incentive for outside private investors con to contribute funds and capital to companies specifically for the purpose of decommissioning wells, even when the company's share price is not expected to increase. Another reason this federal leadership is necessary is because of the 2019 Redwater Supreme Court decision that was the right ruling, but at a very challenging time. It says that when an oil and gas company goes bankrupt, the assets from that company have to go towards paying for the company's environmental liabilities first, such as oil and gas wells, before lenders and investors are paid back. So one consequence, of course, is that that ruling dried up private sector sources of investment, compounding all the other challenges that are harming small and medium producers in Canada. And of course, oil and gas producers are already cutting spending and capital investment plans aggressively just to try and survive. Now, I want to stress that from my perspective, the growing number of suspended and inactive wells awaiting decommissioning is not evasion nor neglect by small and medium oil and gas producers in Canada. It's in fact a stark reality of their precarious economic positions. It's a consequence of all of the damaging policies that have undermined competitiveness and tanked Canadian oil, oil and gas investment. So it's the duty of the federal government to help figure this out. Smaller producers simply don't have the money left in their businesses, and if the status quo continues, they simply can't raise the money needed to proactively address their inactive wells in the current conditions. In 2009, the previous Conservative government committed to ending inefficient, and I think wrong-headed, subsidies to oil and gas, and despite the rhetoric from others, the current Liberals removed any remaining, as well as some benchmark industry tax treatment from oil and gas, but not other industries. I support those measures. And the previous Conservative government advanced the polluter pay principle in Canadian law. Bill C-221 reinforces the standard of polluter pay and protects taxpayers from the potential burden of billions of public dollars needed for remediation and reclamation. The federal government's finance department confirms that this proposal is not a subsidy. The department defines a subsidy as, quote, federal tax expenditures that provide preferential tax treatment that specifically supports the production or the consumption of fossil fuels. And the International Energy Agency doesn't consider this measure to be a subsidy either. Their definition of a subsidy is, quote, any government action that lowers the cost of energy production, raises the revenues of energy producers, or lowers the price paid by energy consumers. 
and it isn't unprecedented. For example, in the mining sector, flow-through share financing contributes over 65% of the funds raised for mining exploration across Canada, a measure Conservatives have always supported and Liberals recently extended. Provinces have called for action on the growing challenge of orphaned and abandoned wells, but the $1.7 billion from the federal government is unfortunately a drop in the bucket compared to the overall up to $70 billion liability in inactive and inactive wells in Canada right now. Alberta is calling for flow-through shares in order to allow the private sector to accelerate oil and gas well reclamation. Premier Scott Bowe of Saskatchewan has also made similar calls. Premier Jason Kenney advocates it, quote, to get the oil field service sector back to work while reducing an environmental liability. The Alberta Finance Minister, Travis Taves, supports the proposal. He says, quote, Bill C-221 builds on the work Alberta has undertaken. Flow-through shares are a game-changer for helping producers raise money from the private sector to decommission oil and gas wells. And the industry wants to do its part to continue being a world leader in environmental stewardship and innovation. Mark Schultz, the president and CEO of the Canadian Association of Oil Well Drilling Contractors, also supports the Environmental Restoration Incentive Act. He said, quote, programs designed to incentivize private investment in well reclamation, for instance, would help provide consistent work over time, which is the foundation for building a steady labour force again in the oil field services sector. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers says, quote, tools to temporarily or more permanently find ways to encourage these companies to raise capital would be exceptionally welcome at this point in time. Things such as flow through shares to help assist with reclamation and remediation is a tool. The Lloydminster Oilfield Technical Society in Lakeland says, quote, we believe that the bill, C221, combined with changes to share structures within Canada, will represent another avenue for the oil and gas industry to repair the damage with which it has been inflicted. And any positive environmental impact in the form of asset retirement will always be looked upon favorably by our group and by the industry. The ability to achieve multi-party support of this initiative is indicative of Canada's society, society's aim to maintain our oil and gas industry as the world leader in responsible development. In my view, the solution to this environmental and financial challenge must prioritize the private sector and should not be solely dependent on taxpayers through big government programs. As a federal MP, this is just one thing that I can do to bring forward a solution now. And it won't fix every issue overnight. But Bill C-221 is good for the environment, it helps struggling small and medium producers, and it builds an opportunity for immediate job creation in experienced high, for experienced, highly skilled workers in the oil and gas service sector now. In order to make the greatest impact and to actually implement the flow through shares part, I am asking all members to partner with me. This must be a collaborative effort with all members of parliament to succeed. During the last Parliament, I had the opportunity to bring forward Motion 167, which called for action to combat rural crime. I work with all parties and secured support from hundreds of organizations and thousands of Canadians across the country. We accepted amendments and ultimately it passed the House of Commons with unanimous support. Because my first goal is always to do what is in the best interests of the people that I represent, for Alberta and for all Canadians. What ultimately matters most to me is doing the right thing and helping to advance meaningful initiatives for people, not politics and not partisanship. Similarly, the current situation with Orphan Wells is escalating with many different impacts in Western Canada, but I believe the objectives of C221 are important to all Canadians. The choice members of Parliament from all parties will have to make is, does the federal government create a path for the private sector to address the surge in inactive and suspended wells to prevent adding to the number of orphaned wells, or will they leave it to the Canadian taxpayers to foot the bill? I want to close by saying Alberta has a long history, an unmatched history, of leadership and on environmental stewardship and innovation in Canada. And this is just another small but creative way to generate jobs and address environmental concerns and protect taxpayers in Alberta and across the country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to <clears throat> thank my, my colleague from Lakeland for her speech and uh, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I, I know she's uh, very concerned about the, the problem of orphan wells. Uh, we're talking about inactive wells here today, uh, and 
I'm particularly concerned about the flow through share aspect. We're, you know, we use flow through shares a lot in the mining industry to, to incentivize uh, investment in exploration and development of mines at a very risky period, uh, risky time in that development. We want uh, our resources to be uh, developed, but it's risky. So we give investors that assessment, as invest, uh, incentive. Here we have an obligation that companies have. They've had it since they started drilling the well. We know it's there, they know it's there, and we, we shouldn't have to incentivize them to put aside that money uh, ahead of time so that taxpayers aren't obliged to it. And I just wondered why the Canadian taxpayer should you know, come in and foot the bill for uh, companies that are just obeying. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry, there's just an, uh, five minutes of questions and comments. I do want to try and get as many as I can. The Honourable uh, Member for Lakeland. Lakehead? I Lake appreciate Land. the member's question. I enjoyed working with him on the Natural Resources Committee in the last uh, in the last term. So my perspective on this is, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, but we need to address the situation that we are in now. This challenge is complex. It is primarily the regulatory and legislative uh, responsibility of provinces. I did work in the Department of Energy in the government of Alberta, and I myself, I said this internally and I have said this publicly, I think there have been lots of missed opportunities in the past, both for regulatory and financial incentives, including legs on business development rules and determining the, the definitions and the outcomes desired for reclamation and remediation. But the reality we are in now, because of the drop in investment, is an increase of hundreds of percentages of orphan and, and uh, abandoned wells. And so it is our duty to partner with provinces to figure out how to solve this problem. And industry says flow through share provisions are a tool that will... Questions and comments on the Rebel Deputy and Jean-Kier. The Honourable Member for Jean-Kier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's a lot of inconsistency in my Conservative colleagues' remarks to my mind. And it takes me back to a discussion that I had some time ago, a discussion with a Conservative and what they said is, we don't want federal funding. We want you to get out of the way. We want uh, less legislation, and we want you to get out of the way. Now, clearly, this morning, what I'm seeing in my colleague's bill is not getting out of the way. It's tax credits. So they want funding for the oil and gas industry, and it's the industry that's received the greatest amount in the country. I can't believe that this bill is something that's moving towards uh, polluter pays. But uh, my colleagues seem to indicate that it could uh, lead us in that direction. But to my mind, we're very far from that reality. <laughs> Madam Speaker, uh, so I, I guess that the member must have missed the first part of my speech when I talked about how this is not a subsidy and is not about taxpayers' money being given to oil and gas companies. In fact, that is exactly what we are seeking to prevent. And in fact, it's Conservatives who are leading on this issue to ensure reclamation and remediation of all of the outstanding oil and gas wells by enabling the private sector to use an incentive to raise funds from investors in order to meet these responsibilities. Now, I would love it to see if any Ontario MP or Quebec MP would stand up here and say they don't support this measure, for example, the for the mining sector or for the under other industries in Canada. Now, this government also needs to get rid of its anti-energy legislation, remove red tape, remove regulation, and allow the Canadian oil and gas sector to actually thrive, but because of a consequence of global factors and their domestic decisions, this is one of the issues that has been created. It is an enormous I, I just want to add, maybe the Honourable Member can finish up her uh, response. Uh, the uh, questions and comments, a brief question from the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. When we look at the, at the reality of the situation, we have a national government today that is investing hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, orphan uh, wells. And, in, in an attempt to work uh, in our prairie provinces to actually make it a difference with the environment and, and the industry as a whole. And the member made reference to a comparison. Ottawa is about a billion dollars in the province of Al uh, Alberta, and the province of Alberta is about 100 million. Does she not recognize or believe that Ottawa and Alberta do need to work together in order to uh, best achieve uh, uh, good results? A member for Lakeland. 
Madam Speaker, Sorry. I do, which is exactly why I'm bringing forward this legislation. I look forward to the member working with this Albertan uh, to help get the private sector funding into the industry that is required for full remediation and reclamation of oil and gas wells in Canada and to protect taxpayers. But of course, the member is not correct. They have not invested hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, oil and gas well remediation and reclamation, aside from, if that's all he's talking about, the $1.7 billion that they split among three provinces. So when the outstanding liability for all active and inactive oil and gas wells in, Alberta, in Canada stands to potentially be between 30 and $70 billion. And the reality is that oil and gas investment, because of their policies in this country, is plummeting, and companies can no longer get private sector investment in order to meet their environmental responsibilities while they develop the resource. That's their job to help yeah. fix. Here, here. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member Davenport. Thank, thank you so much, Madam Speaker. It's an absolute pleasure for me to rise in this venerable House to speak to uh, Bill C-221, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, a private member's bill sponsored by the Honourable Member from uh, Lakeland. Not only do I appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's debate, and would like to th but I'd also like to thank the Honourable Member for raising the important issue of support for Canada's oil and gas sector. The federal government knows that COVID-19 has been a profound shock to our economy and has dramatically changed the way we go about our daily lives, especially for those working in Canada's energy sector. Right now, oil and gas workers and their families are struggling because of things that are beyond their control. Both the devastating effects of the pandemic and the low prices caused by a surge in global crude oil supply are a challenge. As a result, companies have had to slow down or pause their operations, leaving far too many people out of work. And that is why, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister announced earlier this year, in April, that the federal government would provide up to $1.72 billion to the governments of Alberta, Saskatchewan and British Columbia, as well as the Alberta Orphan Wells Association, to clean up orphan and inactive oil and gas wells. These wells, which are no longer in use, can be detrimental not only to our environment, but also to people's health. Think of the farmer whose family can't grow anything on their land because of an, ab an abandoned well a few steps away from their home. Think of the small town or indigenous community struggling with this issue that has been festering for years and even in some cases for decades. Cleaning them up will bring people back to work and help many landowners who have had these wells on their property for years but haven't been able to get them cleaned up and their land restored. Our goal, Madam Speaker, by investing in the remediation of oil and inactive oil and gas wells is to create immediate jobs in these provinces while helping companies avoid bankruptcy and supporting our environmental targets. Alberta, for example, estimates that its share of the federal support, up to $1.2 billion, will help the province maintain 5,200 jobs and clean up 30,000 wells. The cleanup cost per well can range from $100,000 to several million dollars, but actual costs can vary significantly depending on the complexity and size of the well or facility or the amount of contamination that is present. As part of these funding agreements, the governments of Alberta and Saskatchewan has committed to implement strengthened regulatory systems to significantly reduce the future prospect of new orphan wells. The goal is that these improvements will lead to a sustainably funded system that ensures companies are bearing the costs of their environmental responsibilities. Federal provincial monitoring committees have been established to track the progress of provincial programs as part of these agreements, and these committees will work with local governments and Indigenous organizations to ensure that important stakeholders are engaged in each process. Um, there has been uh, widespread support uh, for the $1.2 uh, billion announcement, Madam Speaker, and I just want to share quotes from a few people that shows, that relates the importance of the funding and as well as its anticipated impact. So from, in a statement uh, from the Business Council of Alberta, who said that the funding announcement is welcome news for uh, energy companies, working Albertans and the environment. 
They said this is a win-win uh, situation that will keep thousands of Albertans working in some of our hardest hit industries while also improving the environment. However, additional support is still needed, specifically liquidity for some of Canada's most significant energy companies. We also heard from the Canadian Association of Petro Petroleum Producers, who also echoed some positive sentiments.